I thank the chair. Mr. President, am I to be recognized for one hour? Senator is correct. I thank the chair. Mr. President, this is the ninth in my series of weekly one-hour speeches on the line item veto. In my speech uh, of the week preceding the 4th of July holiday, I noted the remarkable uh, economic and social changes that had occurred in Rome and throughout Italy during the period of Rome's phenomenal territorial expansion in the third and second centuries uh, BC. I noted that uh, there had been an emergence of two political factions. The Optimates, who represented the senatorial oligarchy and other aristocrats, and the Populares, or the People's Party, who represented the proletariat and those elements that were discontented with the existing social order and who demanded uh, certain reforms. I also observed the growing rivalry between the Senate and the equestrian order. The roots of the equestrian order went back to the days of early Rome, to the equities who composed the cavalry of the Roman armies. We also noted the, the rapid growth in the Latifundia, the large plantation type farms that spread throughout Italy and that resulted from the diminishing number of small family farms from which had uh, come the stalwart citizen soldiery during the centuries of the Regal period and uh, the early and middle republics. We noted also the, the growing slave economy and the serious problems of unemployment in the cities and uh, the serious problem, of course, that resulted from the spread of the Latifundia and the diminishing number of small family far farms, the serious vanishing peasantry from the land. Tiberius Gracchus, who was a tribune in 133 BC, had been traveling through Etruria when he noticed a dearth of inhabitants. And he noted that the soil was tilled and the, and the uh, flocks were taken care of by slaves. And he wondered how the great Roman Republic could continue to, to be independent and continue in its leadership if the vanishing peasantry were supplanted by slaves from foreign country, foreign countries. In those days, in order to be a soldier, one was required to have property. And so this matter concerned Tiberius and he felt that in view of the vanishing peasantry from the land, then the armies of Rome would suffer. And it constituted a menace uh, to the Republic. I'm reminded that Tiberius's concerns were echoed by Oliver Goldsmith in the deserted village who picked up this theme that had uh, so disturbed uh, Tiberius Gracchus. Ill fares the land to hastening ills a prey, where wealth accumulates and men decay. Princes and lords may flourish or may fade. A breath can make them as a breath has made 
but a bold peasantry, their country's pride, when once destroyed, can never be supplied. And so we see in this another parallel between the history of the Romans and the history of our own country. As we've experienced the shift away from the small family farms to the large corporate farms and the movement away from what was once a predominantly rural population in this country to the huge sprawling urban communities with their uh, problems of poverty and disease and unemployment and crime and a declining family standard of values and declining religious values. So it was to these problems that Tiberius Gracchus in 133 BC sought to address his legislation, which was very much opposed by the Senate uh, oligarchy. And he paid with his life for his efforts. It cost him his life at the hands of a mob made up of slaves and clients of the senatorial order and other aristocrats. I've mentioned the word client uh, several times during this series of speeches, and I should digress, uh, digress momentarily to explain the, the meaning of the term when used in this context. In uh, early Rome, it was customary for poorer citizens to attach themselves to a rich or influential citizen in return for his uh, financial assistance or legal assistance, and uh, he thus became their patron. They, the poorer citizens who had attached themselves to the more influential citizen, became clients, and uh, in return for his uh, for his financial assistance and other types of uh, aid, they gave to him their political support and their private support. And it was a matter of uh, great prestige for the, for the patron to appear in public surrounded by a large delegation of these respectful clients. They not only owed him their political support and private support, but they also uh, owed him their respect. And they showed him, showed him this by greeting him in the morning and by accompanying him out into the city, uh, which, as I say, was a matter of great prestige for him. Also, in those early times, when uh, enemy peoples were conquered or when an enemy city was captured and destroyed, the conquered peoples were sold as slaves. It was uh, the right of any owner of a slave to manumit that slave whenever and however he pleased. And when the owner manumitted a slave, the freedman then became his client, and uh, the former owner became the patron. Now, the law recognized this relationship, and uh, it had legal sanction, and the patron and the client were not allowed to give testimony against one another. In 123 BC, Gaius Gracchus, the younger brother of Tiberius, was elected uh, tribune. And uh, again in 123 BC, in 124, Gaius was elected tribune, following the death of his brother by a decade. And in one, 123, Gaius was re-elected. 
uh, Tribune. Uh, contrary to the established practice, which precluded uh, one's uh, election to the same office, uh, unless 10 years had passed. Well, Gaius uh, carried forward the agrarian policies of his dead brother, and his aims went uh, even further. Several of his laws were clearly designed to strengthen the equestrians and to weaken the Senate. As, for example, his law uh, changing the composition of jurors placement of the senator's own jurors by, by the equestrians, that uh, he fully recognized the significance and the implications of this law was shown by his remark to someone that even if he should die, he would leave it, meaning the law, as a sword thrust into the side of the senate. Gaius also sought to reestablish an Italian peasantry on the land, as his brother had before him, as a means of bringing new strength to the Roman armies, while at the same time ridding the cities of, of idle hands. Gaius was... Uh, not su successful in his effort to be elected tribune for a third time. And when he was no longer tribune, the consul, Lucius Opimius, summoned Gaius to appear before the Senate to answer questions concerning the actions that he, Gaius, had taken during his two terms as tribune. Paterculus, a historian who lived between the years 19 B.C. and 30 A.D., writes that Gaius was determined not to be arrested, not to appear before the Roman Senate, and that in his flight, at the point of time in which he was about to be apprehended by the emissaries of Opimius. He offered his neck to the sword of his friendly slave, Eupharus. The body of Gaius, like the body of Tiberius before him, was unceremoniously cast into the Tiber so that he would not be able to enjoy the quiet repose of the grave. Many of his followers were, were executed. The Senate had suffered a great loss to its uh, prestige and its authority. And even though the Gracchan threat had been eliminated, the Senate owed its victory to violence. And this was a precedent uh, which might be turned against the Senate itself in due time. Moreover, the alliance of the equestrians and the urban proletariat had proved to be stronger than the, than the Senate. And this, too, was a lesson that was not lost on uh, future leaders' ambitious uh, for power. So here we, we have the Senate having suffered in its prestige and in its authority.
from these uh, struggles between, that occurred between the Krakens and uh, itself. Meanwhile, while at Rome, the interest uh, had been centered upon these struggles. Roman armies had been uh, busy fighting wars in the defense of Roman territory. As a result of which, in uh, 121 BC, the Romans became masters of southern Gaul. From the Alps to the Pyrenees. In 112 BC, Rome became involved in a serious conflict in North Africa. in Numidia. Her involvement uh, revealed to the world the corruption of the ruling class in Rome. And it also rekindled the smoldering fires of internal political strife. The occasion was the death in 118 BC of Mesipsa, successor to Masinissa, king of Numidia and loyal ally of Rome. Mesipsa had bequeathed his kingdom to his two sons, Adherbal and Hiempsal. And to a nephew, Jugurtha, whom he had adopted several years before. Jugurtha was able and energetic but it was also ambitious and unscrupulous. So while preparations were being made for the division of the kingdom among the three heirs, Jugurtha had Hiempsil assassinated and expelled Adherbal, who fled to Rome and appealed for aid. It is difficult to understand the motivations of the Roman Senate in the imbroglio that followed. Rome had no obligation to interfere in the internal affairs of the Numidians. But so successful and influential were Jugurtha's agents that a commission sent to Numidia in 116 BC to partition the country gave to Jugurtha the western and richer half of the kingdom leaving the eastern and poorer part to Adherbal. Jugurtha, however, had no intention of ruling only half the country. His aim was to be the ruler of all of Numidia. And so, he provoked Adherbal to war 
and he blockaded at Herbal in his capital city of Sirta, which was uh, aided in its defense by the local Italian business community. At Herbal again appealed to Rome, and Rome sent out, the Roman Senate sent out commissions to investigate. But they succumbed to, to Jugurtha's diplomacy. And the decision was made to force the city to surrender. At Herbal and uh, the city's defenders were executed, many of whom were Italian. This created a storm in Rome when war was declared. The Roman consul Lucius Calpurnius Bestia, B E S T I A, invaded Numidia. But Jugurtha resorted to bribes and secured easy terms for peace that aroused uh, such suspicions among the equestrians in Rome that the opponents of the Senate forced an investigation. Jugurtha was summoned to appear before the Senate to answer questions as to his relations with Numidian officials in Numidia, uh, with Roman officials in Numidia. Appearing in Rome, he immediately bought the intervention of two Roman tribunes who voted against the taking of any testimony from him. Confident that he could purchase immunity for any action. He secured uh, the assassination in Rome itself of a rival claimant to the Numidian throne. His uh, friends in the Senate dared protect him no longer, and he was ordered to leave Italy. The war was reopened and a battle was fought in which the Roman army was defeated and forced to pass under the yoke, a matter of great humiliation, pass under the yoke and released uh, only uh, after its commander had conceded to an alliance between Jugurtha and Rome. Treachery and bribery had played a part in this shameful episode. The terms were rejected by the Roman Senate, and a new consul, Quintus Cecilius Metellus, surnamed Numidicus, took command. And one of his staff officers, officers was a man named Gaius Marius. Now, Gaius Marius was an ambitious and able officer. And he implored uh, Metellus that he, Marius, be allowed to go to Rome and stand for the office of consul. And Marius' uh, reaction was one that insulted uh, Marius. And so from that time on, he uh, had a bitter feeling toward Metellus and intrigued against him.
finally Metellus agreed to let Marius go to Rome to stand for consul. In 107 BC, Metellus was elected consul. And the populares secured the passage of a law by the tribal assembly transferring the command in Numidia from Metellus to Marius. The Senate, take note, the Senate yielded in this encroachment by the populares on its traditional rights. And Marius pursued uh, the battle in North Africa with uh, energy, enthusiasm, and effectiveness. His quester, or quartermaster, was Lucius Cornelius Sulla, who was destined in due time to become a bitter rival. Marius pressed the war with great vigor and won hard-fought victories over Jugurtha. And his father-in-law, Bacchus, king of Mauritania, located to the east of Numidia. Sulla, in due time, was successful in capturing Jugurtha at great risk to his own life. And he captured Jugurtha through the treachery of Bacchus, whose betrayal of his son-in-law brought an end to the war. Jugurtha was taken to Rome, where he was executed after gracing the triumph of Marius in 105 BC. The repercussions of the Jugurthan War were significant. The prestige of the Roman Senate having already suffered from the Gracchan assault, was weakened still further by the apparent corruptibility and venality of senators in dealing with Jugurtha, and also by the populares and the equestrians who had intervened in foreign policy. And the transfer of the command in Numidia from Metellus to Marius. So once again, the equestrians and the city proletariat had shown that they were stronger than the Senate and that they could control public policy. The Jugurthan War had also produced a military leader in the person of Marius, behind whom these elements could combine. Marius was uh, again elected consul in 104 BC. The Roman people disregarding the required legal interval of 10 years. 
He was given the command against the northern barbarians in Gaul. He set to work immediately in reorganizing and strengthening the Roman army. Not only did he bring about improvements, may I say to my good friend, the senior senator from Alaska, who serves here on the defense subcommittee of the Committee on Appropriations. He was a very able member of that subcommittee and full committee, and he was tremendously interested in military affairs. Not only did Marius bring about improvements in legionary tactics and equipment and weapons and organization, but he also accepted as recruits citizens whose lack of property had previously disqualified them from service in the legions. He accepted men with, who, who had no property at all. This was a great and far-reaching change that Marius brought about. He transformed military service from an obligation to the Roman state to a career. Which could employ thousands of landless and unemployed Romans. Marius's innovation thus made possible the creation of large standing armies for the first time. The creation of large standing armies in Roman provinces such as Spain, and Asia, and Africa. Loyalty to the Roman state came to be supplanted by loyalty to a successful general. Who could, reply, who could rely on the support of his soldiers against civil authority and on the support of his veterans to back him in subsequent political campaigns. Marius was uh, re-elected consul for the years 103 and 102 and 101, since the threat from the northern barbarians continued. In his fifth term as consul in 101 BC, Marius was victorious over the Cimbri and the Teutons, and Rome was thereby saved from a repetition of the Gallic invasion of the fourth century BC. A coalition among three men Lucius Saturninus and Gaius Servilius Glaucia and Marius resulted in a sixth term as consul for Marius in the year 100 BC. That was the year in which Julius Caesar was born. And Julius Caesar was a nephew of Marius. By marriage. It also resulted in re election to the office of tribune for a second term for uh, 
Saturninus and Clausia. Clausia and uh, Saturninus uh, became candidates again for the following year, 99 BC. But Glaucia had a rival candidate murdered, which provoked uh, violent disorders. The Senate adopted a decree calling on Marius to restore order. Marius forced, forced the surrender of Glaucia and Saturninus and placed them in a building for safe keeping, but their enemies tore off the roof of the building and stoned them to death. Marius suffered a political eclipse and went into seclusion for several years. The Senate was once more triumphant, and the populares were discredited. The Optimates celebrated their triumph by seeking to place a check on demagogic legislation through the passage of law. that declared the inclusion of unrelated or extraneous topics in any single legislative enactment illegal. And requiring the customary interval of three market days between the formal publication of an impending measure and the actual voting on it to be strictly observed. So here, I see my friend from Mississippi smiling. I see a smile on my friend's face from Alaska. They know what I'm about to say. Here was a type of bird rule. 2,092 years ago, dealing with unrelated and extraneous matter. Perhaps an awareness of these uh, rules of parliamentary procedure in ancient Rome will help the members of the United States Senate and House of Representatives to better appreciate and understand the importance and significance of our own rules. In 91 BC, A Roman tribune, Livius Drusus, D-R-U-S-U-S, promised uh, non-Roman Italians that he would bring forth legislation to give them Roman citizenship. The Senate and the equestrians were very much opposed to this, and Drusus, learning of a plot against his life, removed himself to the atrium of his house where he transacted the public's business. It was poorly lighted and uh, one evening when he was sending the crowd away, he suddenly exclaimed that he was wounded and fell down as he uttered the words. A shoemaker's knife was found thrust into his back. When the Italians heard of the murder of Drusus, they considered it no longer tolerable for those who were laboring for their political advancement to suffer such outrages. 
And as they saw no other means of acquiring citizenship, they, desired, they decided to revolt against the Romans altogether and to make war against them. They therefore uh, sent emissaries secretly to one another, formed a league, and exchanged hostages as a pledge of good faith. They also sent uh, ambassadors to Rome to complain that although they had helped Rome to fight its wars of conquest, the Romans had not been willing to admit them to citizenship. The Roman Senate sternly rejected their pleas. Appianus, or Appian, states in his History of the Civil Wars that when the revolt broke out, all of the neighboring peoples declared war at the same time. Thus, in the year 90 BC, the social war began. It is sometimes referred to as the Marsic War, sometimes as the Italic War, sometimes as the war against the Allies. The non-Roman Italians had forces amounting to about 100,000 foot soldiers and horsemen. Besides the soldiers that remained as guards in each town. The Romans uh, sent an equal force against them, composed of the Roman legions and Italian peoples who were still in alliance with them. The Romans were led by the two consuls, Sextus Julius Caesar and uh, Publius Rutilius Lupus. Serving with them as generals were such renowned men as Gaius Marius, um, Lucius Cornelius Sulla, Gaius Perpenna, Publius Licinius Crassus, Nius Pompeius Strabo, the father of Pompey, and under whom Pompey and Cicero served during the social war. The, the non-Roman armies had uh, several very renowned generals as, as well to lead their united forces. The consul Rutilius Lupus lost his life in the war, as did tens of thousands of others on both sides. The body of Rutilius, along with the bodies of many others, were brought to Rome for burial. The corpses made a piteous spectacle. And the Roman Senate decreed that from that time, those who were killed in the war should be buried where they fell. In order that the spectacle might not deter others from entering the army. Another consul subsequently was killed, Cato Portius. The Romans uh, decided to bring an end to this terrible war, which was costing them so heavily in treasure and, and blood. So they conceded the issue at stake. All Italy was now united, and all of the people south of the Po River received Roman citizenship. 
by promising Roman citizenship to all those who had not yet revolted or who would lay down their arms. The Roman Senate belatedly acknowledged the folly of its policy opposing Drusus. The revolt had brought Marius out of exile, and the Senate had appointed Lucius Cornelius Sulla to the command in Asia Minor. Against the uh, able and ambitious king of Pontus, Mithridates VI, Jupiter. With the aid of uh, a demagogic tribune, however, the command in Asia Minor was transferred by law to Marius, whereupon Sulla marched his army back to Rome. The aid uh, of uh, a demagogic tribune named uh, Publius Sulpicius Rufus was brought to bear, and Marius and Rufus hastily collected troops. to fight a pitched battle of Romans against Romans in and around the city itself. Appian writes that now for the first time an army of her own citizens invaded Rome as a hostile country. From this time, he went on to say, all civil dissensions were decided only by the arbitrament of arms. Sulla was victorious. Marius barely escaped with his life to Mauritania. So Sulpicius was killed. And his head severed from his body and nailed to the rostra in front of the, in the forum. We're told that Sulpicius had been betrayed by a slave. And that Sulla rewarded the slave for his services by freeing him. And then, and then had him executed for his treachery to another man. Sulpicius. Well, Sulla hastily tried to reorganize the Roman government by strengthening the Roman Senate 
and by reviving the army assembly, the commissioners centuriator. And by using it to replace the tribal assembly, the commissioned tributor. Leaving two consuls Lucius Cornelius Senna and Gaius Octavius sworn to support the new constitution. Sulla hurried off to fight Mithridates in Asia Minor. He had not gone been gone long before Senna impeached Sulla and proposed the recall of Marius. The Senate deposed Senna. He was driven from the city by the other consul, Neus Octavius. Senna fled to raise an army to return and besiege Rome. Marius returned, and the two of them overcame all resistance, again capturing Rome with a Roman army. <coughs> with a cruelty beyond belief, they hunted down their opponents. Octavius and leading senators and equities were brutally slain. Appian writes, they killed remorselessly all the heads of senators were exposed in front of the rostra. All the friends of Sulla were put to death. His home was razed to the ground, his property confiscated, and himself voted a public enemy. Search was made for his wife and children, but they escaped. In the year 86 BC, Marius died. Soon after beginning his seventh term as consul, leaving uh, Senna to lord it over Rome, where he was supreme, where he wielded the all important powers as consul for that year and for the succeeding two years. Meanwhile, in Asia Minor, Sulla was victorious. He had slain thousands and collected a vast treasure. He now prepared to return with a well-equipped seasoned army to exact the terrible revenge which he had been planning in cold blood. Senna was not unaware of the fate that awaited him. 
So he started with an army to sail to Macedonia to intercept Sulla. But Senna was assassinated by his own soldiers in a mutiny at Brundisium. And the fleet did not sail. The followers of Maria and Marius and uh, Senna, nevertheless, would not yield in Italy without a struggle. Sulla landed in Italy in 83 BC. And at the Colin Gate, he destroyed an opposing army. Massacring to the man the Samnites who had joined it. With a ruthless barbarity. He pursued all those whom he considered to be his enemies, putting up proscription lists of their names and declaring rewards for those who murdered them or who informed against them. Paterculus, the historian, says that Sulla was first to set the precedent of proscriptions. Plutarch says that husbands were dispatched in the bosoms of their wives and sons in those of their mothers. The innocent rich were included in the proscription lists in order that their property might be confiscated. All of Italy was in terror of Sulla's name. After a while, the proscriptions ceased and Sulla went about the business of reorganizing the government. Sulla was named a dictator in 82 BC. He brought about uh, the appointment of an interrex whom he, Sulla, persuaded under a special law that the Senate had yielded to, prevailed upon the Interrex to appoint him as dictator, Sulla, for an indeterminate term. Under this special law, a dictator could be appointed for an indeterminate term. This meant that Sulla had all of the powers of consuls and tribunes and censors, the combined powers of all the magistrates. And whereas the old office of dictator had allowed the appoint, the old, the old law concerning dictators had, had allowed the appointment of a dictator for a limited term of no more than six months, this new law made possible the appointment of Sulla as dictator. And he was given by virtue of his unlimited term and the scope of his powers. He became the most powerful person 
in Roman history at that time, to that, to that time. You had supreme autocratic authority. How much time do I have? President, I ask uh, unanimous consent to proceed for another, not to exceed uh, another 10 minutes. Without objection. So ordered. Mr. President, uh, Sulla was now the complete and absolute master of Italy. And so, he reshaped the Roman government. And recreated it in accordance with his own conservative ideas. He made the Roman Senate the most, most powerful body in the state, diminished the powers of the tribunes, subjected all magistrates to strict accountability, and deprived uh, the equestrians of the privilege that had been granted to them by Gaius Gracchus of sitting as judges in their own cause. Sulla also sought to improve the caliber of men sent to govern the Republic's growing empire. He tightened up the whole machinery of government and settled thousands of his veterans in land through, on land throughout Italy. that had been confiscated from the vast numbers who had perished or been pros proscribed in the terrible slaughter that he had let loose. And when Sulla voluntarily retired in the year 79 BC, he depended upon his aristocratic friends not to allow any infraction of the uh, revised form of senatorial government that he had created. He died the following year, 78 BC, probably from colon cancer. And Mr. President, as we look back now, we see momentous changes that have taken place. Elderly Romans who were boys in the days prior to Tiberius Gracchus had seen their world overturned. Young Romans like Pompey and Cicero who were 28 and Julius Caesar who was 21 when Sullen, Sulla retired had lived through unspeakable horrors that were utterly alien to the traditional idealized notions that they had held about their country. The Roman Republic was still a republic, but it was far different from the republic that had existed already 350 years 
when it attracted the admiration of the historian Polybius in the middle of the second century BC. The army had changed. It was no longer made up of the tough rural farmers, many of whom came from the mountainous, the most mountainous parts of the peninsula. Marius, in creating a professional army, had uh, created a new base of power for ambitious men to exploit and use as an instrument of despotic authority. And what of the Roman Senate? In the old heroic days, the Senate was the most powerful body in the state and it held supreme power because of the respect given to its wise, courageous, and incorruptible leadership. But the powers that Sulla conferred upon the Senate, he had increased the number of senators to 600 during his dictatorship. The powers that Sulla conferred on the Roman senators made them neither wise nor courageous. And as to, to the incorruptibility of the Senate, which Cineus in 280 BC had compared to an assemblage of kings Its sad decline was pregnant in the prescient words uttered by Jugurtha 170 years later when he was ordered, at the time he was ordered to leave Italy. After passing through the gates of Rome, it is said that he looked back at the city several times in silence. Suddenly he exclaimed, yonder is a city put up for sale and his days are numbered if it finds a buyer. Mr. President, the Republic's days were numbered. I yield the floor. 